Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. If you want to open your Bibles to John chapter 5, verse 31, that is where we'll begin here in just a few minutes. We want to thank you for your interest in our study. And if this is your first time uh, joining us for a Bible study, we'd encourage you to participate. If you have any thoughts or comments, share them with us. Now, if you are watching this on our Facebook page, then you can comment in the area connected there with this video stream. If you are have joined us on our YouTube channel, then use the chat area there connected with this live stream. Or you can also contact us via email, and that email address is questions at truthfactorlive.com. Questions at truthfactorlive.com. We'll bring that up there real quick just to kind of show that. And then let's bring everyone into the discussion. Gentlemen, how are you all doing today? Doing really well. Good, yes. good. I'm doing are, okay. Okay. Bob, you doing all right? I'm doing, I'm doing well, but uh, it is a, a thunderstorm or something here. Mm -hmm. Got some inclement weather anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, I think there's a, like a tornado warning out there. Till about one o'clock, and so I may go out. I don't know. You know, it would be tragic, but a little bit great for ratings if we saw Bob in his swivel chair spinning up. Yeah, you know? but then we'd be afraid of the rapture, and worst of all, Bob got to go and we did. That would be <laughs> doubly bad. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, and under the Gospel of John. Well, I, that's right. Well, I'm going. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Um, so we're picking up today in our study through the gospel of John. We are in the fifth chapter and we're going to resume with verse number 31 of John chapter five. So let's go ahead and, um, oh, actually, let me see. We've got some who've joined us already. Aileen and Michael Davis. We have Jared Dart with us, David Clark. And, you know, again, if you're a first time, um, participant in our study, if you want to drop, um, just tell us your first name if you want to and where you're from. That'll help us kind of, kind of have an idea of who's with us today. But if you don't want to, that's fine. Just study along with us um, and hopefully benefit from our study of the Word of God. So let's see, Brian, let's start with you. And we started there in verse 31. And I'm guessing, let's see, um, let's go ahead and read down through verse 40. All right. Kind of get, get that in there, the context there. All right. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version this morning. Um, we begin in John chapter 5, verse 31. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he testifies of me is true. You have sent John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive the testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him, you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me, that you may have life. All righty. <clears throat> okay, so backing up to verse 31, there is kind of a, um, a, a legal, not illegal, but there is a way that Jesus is addressing this that appears on the outset to, to contradict chapter eight and his statements there. But when he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. In, in what viewpoint is he saying, talking about that, Brian? Yeah. So in chapter eight, Jesus will say, I testify of myself. So he will, he will say, I bear witness of myself. So that at first, as you said, you, you think, is it a contradiction? But what he's actually saying is, if he testifies of himself alone, that there's a question about this. We can kind of even think of the idea that under the law of Moses, that there were two or three witnesses required that a fact might be verified. What's really neat here is he begins a list that we can kind of add up in our head that totals to seven 
testimonies or seven witnesses uh, of Jesus as the Christ. Jesus, of course, he does himself testify of himself. He'll say the Spirit of God will testify of him later. This is whenever he's promising the Spirit. He says the Father testifies of him. He says John the Baptist testifies of him. He says the miracles that he performs testify of him. He says the scriptures, the Old Testament prophecies, they testify of him. And later he's going to tell the apostles that the apostles will testify of him. So there are going to be seven testimonies to the identity of Christ, and they're all very important testimonies, of course. Um, and as I, as we've already said, two or three witnesses uh, establish a truth. Here we have this perfect, total testimony of things that are uh, speaking to the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Okay. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the way, that's a good explanation of it. You know, um, it's, it's the, his viewpoint here is not from the same viewpoint of chapter eight. Um, and so he says, there is another who bears witness of me. And I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So who's he talking about here? He's talking about John, isn't he? There in verse three. Yeah, John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah. John the Baptist. Yeah. 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 Uh, you've sent John and he has borne witness to the truth. And so verse 34, yet I do not receive testimony from man but I say these things that you may be saved. So ultimately, what is the pur purpose of the witnessing, if you would, that's going on? Well, it's to identify Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And we can kind of see that if we go back and look at John's testimony back in chapter 1. In chapter 1 and verse 15, John bore witness of it and cried out and said, This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me. Uh, and he goes on to say in verse 19, here is the testimony of John. Um, John, I actually like what you said about this all being a very legal kind of language. John, John, I think one of the interesting things about the way John writes, and it's it's something that, you know, sometimes you, you're wondering what is the Holy Spirit and what is the flavor of the writer. And I've often felt like one of the flavors that John, the writer, writes in is legal. Um, you look at first John and he talks about the advocate, Jesus, the advocate. He talks about a trial, you know, God, the judge. There's a lot of legal language in here about judgment, about testimony, you know, uh, about the things that bear witness. Um, and I always think that that's kind of an interesting thing to think about that John, uh, oftentimes is describing our lives like a great, great trial, you know, a great court case. And, you know, we need Jesus. God is the father is judge, the judge of all. We have an accuser that's accusing us. We we have an advocate if we're in Christ, and and that advocate's uh, certification is sevenfold. And so I sometimes like to think of John writing from a very legal sense of being defended, passing from judgment, he said before, being another one of those terms that he uses. Right, you know, and, and, and you add to that, he says, witnesses. You know, as a matter of fact, the headings in my book, or the headings in the, the New King James Version, uh, I, I've preached a sermon a time or two. It's been years, uh, but I, on this text called the fourfold witness, because that's actually what you have here. You know, in this text alone, you have four of those seven witnesses that you were talking about. And, you know, you talk about the gospel of John being um, a legal, you know, using legal terminology. He's also, and I describe it as the most apologetic of the four, not, not I'm sorry, but 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 apologetic from the standpoint of of making the defense because you know John does come along later you know this is obviously the last of the gospels and i i do believe he had at least some of the other gospels when i, I i'm not maybe either at, not as a source but more than that he had the gospels and he elaborated on those or he explained things uh, clarified things that were in those other Gospels. Not, he wasn't just copying them, which, by the way, is the accusation of of skeptics, you know, and critics of Scripture. They talk about they copied each other, and you really don't have four different sources. I differ. I beg to differ with that. So, I, I mean, I I, uh, I could make a case that they're all independent. You know, uh, but that's the point of this text. And here's Jesus. The same thing that John does, Jesus did the same thing. You know, here you, you know, you talk about the legal. Jesus is dealing with the, the scribes and the Pharisees who are legalistic and stuff. And Jesus is turning their 
their accusations against them by saying, look, it's not just me. Matter of fact, uh, you know, Jesus has almost made statements. These aren't the words, but he's almost made statements to the effect of, I don't care if you like me. I don't care if you believe me. Look at the independent witnesses and what they have said. And he goes back, first of all, to John the Baptist, and he's going to end up going to the law of Moses and, and, uh, and, and showing, look, I even fulfill that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good you point. You know, I wonder, <laughs> cannot a case be made that verse 32 is a reference to the Father and not to John the Baptist? Uh, at least the translators of the New King James seem to think so, but capitalizing the he, the H in a he, so that he goes from his own personal testimony to the greatest testimony of the father and then he mentions these others as being supplemental uh to that and so uh he mentions himself then he mentions the father then he mentions john the baptist and uh and then the true uh then the, the father works. again yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, yeah. verse yeah, 37 he, he mentions works, the father and then the father again and then the scripture or Moses. Yeah. So I mean, and to me, the, the, the father's testimony would be the strongest. And I don't know why he would not jump from his own personal testimony to that of the father. And it would be, as Brian pointed out, an ellipsis. Uh, if I bear witness of myself, uh, if I only bear witness of myself, or if I am only the one bearing witness, uh, yeah, that would not be sufficient, but there, the Father bears with me, bears witness of me. Uh, John the Baptist bears witness of me. But then he says in verse 34, yet I do not receive the te testimony from man. Uh, he's not dependent upon John's, uh, John's testimony. Even though John was the burning and shining lamp uh, that only existed for a time, and uh, and they did rejoice in his light because he did uh, light the way for Jesus. Uh, he made straight the paths of Jesus, etc. And so that that would be a reference to the work of John the Baptist. Uh, but then again, as as has been pointed out, but I have a greater witness in John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do. And here, it's not even the, the Father's testimony, but the works that he did uh, that testify of him is, is what verse 36 is about. Uh, the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And uh, so there's his, his personal uh Qualifications, uh, credentials <clears throat> are his miracles. But behind mm -hmm. his miracles, there certainly is uh, the one who, who, who is behind him in that. Uh, and that would be the father. I mean, I think, uh, I you, guess it's possible. Um, go ahead, Tom. You know, I, I was going to say, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've always looked at the another that he mentions there as being John because he mentions him next, John the Baptist. And and the thing is, is John the Baptist, they could relate to in the fact that they had physically seen the John, had seen John. And then you have later on in the verses 37 and 38 where Jesus specifically mentions the Father having testified of him. And I kind of wonder with that one whether or not He's talking about the time that his voice declared, Spoke. you know, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. Uh, but, but having said that, though, would not all four witnesses be of the Father? Yes. And, and it's even verse 38, you do not have his word. Yeah. Uh, the word of the Father would be more than just the words that he spoke at the baptism of Je at Jesus. Yeah. Uh, that would be the entire 
uh, canon of the Old Testament, the Jewish canon. Yeah, which he goes into after yeah. that, you and know, so the, the Moses. They didn't have that in their heart. They they weren't. Uh, what what I think is interesting. Concerned with that as they should have been. What's that, John? Well, I was I was just going to throw something. If we kind of go what we've been looking at so far in John, one of the interesting things is is that we've actually had a series of people coming to believe in Jesus based on individual, each of these testimonies individually. So John chapter 1, John the Baptist. Why does John the Baptist believe? Because he heard the Father's voice from heaven. He says, I heard the Father from heaven. I know this is the one. Peter and Andrew, why do they believe? They believe because they heard John's testimony. So they believe because of that. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Why does Nicodemus believe? He says in verse 2, because we've seen the signs that you present. John chapter 4, we meet the woman at the well. Why does she believe? Because Jesus takes her to the scriptures and shows the scriptures speak to him. Every one of these people believed, not because they heard all seven witnesses, but just one of the witnesses was enough to confirm for each of them. And I think what's interesting is that, you know, but it takes different things. It's this idea that the different things working, they're all working together, but each one individually is sufficient to have convicted people to make the confession, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So it's kind of neat to see how John is walking through this, and he's actually demonstrating these things. We saw again a sign, a miracle uh, in John chapter 5 uh, earlier, um, and we'll kind of see how it's played through in these ways that these things will convict people, but even so far we've seen these things at work and seen them convicting people. So what John is doing, he's weaving all of these things together uh, into, <clears throat> into not so much a cord, but maybe even a rope. Uh, 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 a line, a line of t a single line of testimony that is made up of a variety of of witnesses and what they testified to, and so they all they all agree, and so yeah, Jesus testified of himself, but he his testimony did not stand on its own merits alone. Uh, and so all of these other things went with it. And so, uh, I think, I think that is definitely true. And I appreciate Brian b reminding us of the, uh, of, of the, the woman, uh, Nicodemus and the woman at the well also, uh, and, and not just the woman at the well, but those that she went to the village to get, to come back and they believed not just on her testimony, but then they experienced Jesus themselves. And uh, also in John chapter 1, you've got uh, Andrew and an unnamed disciple who is probably uh, the, uh, the Apostle John. Uh, and Andrew, he's so impressed, he goes and gets Peter. Uh, and, and I think... And we need to distinguish, too, between the author of the gospel, the Apostle John, and John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh, the benefit of, the, of those who are watching might not perceive that distinction as, as often as they need to. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, and, and that's a good point. You know, uh, one other point to build on all of this is the four witnesses that are dealt with in this text. John expounds on every one of those throughout the gospel the apostle john yeah yeah the apostle john yeah and, and the interesting thing i mean uh, here is the apostle john and he's talking about john the baptist uh in third person so well so you've got you have three you have john and his cohorts talking about the writings of the apostle john as he relays the testimony of john the baptizer yeah um, so come, real quick, come back to verse 32 and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on here in a minute. What's interesting, about, interesting, interesting about 32, and we'll bring in what, what everybody just said. And I, there's a lot of good points there. Verse 32 is very nonspecific. He says, there's another who bears witness of me. So who is that other? Well, I like the argument that it could be talking about John in 34 and 30, 33 and 34, but I also like the argument that it could be a summary statement of all the testimonies that are coming that originate actually from the father. 
Yeah. You know, kind of a sub because he's very nonspecific about it. So either he's talking about John because John's immediate or he's talking about the full summation of the witnesses that God made possible, whether it be through John or the miracles or even Jesus himself, you know. Um, okay. all, all of those things woven together are the father's testimony. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, when we get to chapter eight, um, Jesus will make a statement and they will reply to him, well, you can't testify of yourself. Your testimony is not true because you're testifying of yourself. And then he will go on to address that issue at that time that yes, he can. But here he's showing that we believe not simply because of what he says, but because of all the witnesses and testimony surrounding it. And really the, the role of the apostles when they are sent out is to testify of Jesus, you know. Um, that's, that's why I've heard it said, we can't be true witnesses today. We can be teachers of his word, but we rely upon the testimony of witnesses who saw and heard the things that he did and things that he preached. Uh, real quick, now, we've got to... Oh, go ahead, Bob. One other thing I want I want to bring out here is that I can understand the synoptics and the argument that the synoptics copied one another. I favor the idea of the uh, the primacy of of Mark that Mark mm -hmm. was probably written first, uh, but John does not really elaborate on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He gives his independent, inspired account because he goes back beyond what what Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew be uh, begins with the lineage of of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mark begins with John the Baptist. Luke begins with uh, uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And uh, but the Apostle John, he goes back to the beginning. And so his testimony, as far as human testimony is concerned, is completely independent of the others. Uh, and it is, it is so clear that he writes by inspiration, not, he's not telling things that he witnessed. He did not witness uh, the son at the beginning. And so he's more than the others, he is testifying regarding what, has been revealed to him uh, by the Holy Spirit. And to that extent, I think John is, is unique. And uh, I think probably it, it almost certainly is the last of the uh, gospel accounts. Uh, pointing out some of the things that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not, were not inspired to mention because their testimony at least Matthew's testimony was limited, it seems, to what he had observed. Yeah. Mark and Luke were not apostles, so they didn't observe any of it. Uh, they learned it either uh, by the teaching of man. Mark was an associate of Peter's. Luke was an associate of, of, uh, of Paul's. And they may have had, well, obviously they had the gift of prophecy or they couldn't have been inspired to write what they wrote. But John really, really goes deep into the deity of Christ and, and all of these witnesses, as Brian pointed out, he we weaves together into the obvious testimony of the Father. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, all right, let's see real quick, a couple uh, comments bring in here. Uh, Caleb says, you have the witness of man, as in John the baptizer, the works God has allowed him to do. Then God himself said it before many at his baptism, Jesus' baptism, and then the Holy Spirit through the scriptures as well. And then Caleb says, technically, we wouldn't know any of this if the Holy Spirit did not reveal it to us through the inspired writers. That's a good point. And then Chris Kramer has decided to join us. So thank you for joining us today, Chris. <laughs> um, Yep. Yep. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. So let's come back to our text here for the time that we have remaining. It's just now 1128. So we're doing pretty good on time. So he continues to, he talks about John verses 35 and 36. Um, it is interesting that he says that John 
He has the burning and shining lamp, and you are willing for a time to rejoice in his light, but I have a greater witness than John's. And that's what we've already talked about, the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And um, the Father himself has testified of me, as we've already talked about. Um, It is interesting to note, though, he says, you have neither... And the Father himself who sent me has testified to me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because him whom he sent, him you did not believe. So what, what is his point there between with verses 30, well, 37 through 39, realistically, or 37 through 40? Any thoughts? They were not attuned to the, to the voice of God. They... They had their misconceptions of the coming kingdom, and this prevented them from understanding or perceiving the testimony of God that was woven through those Old Testament passages and also caused them to miss the significance uh, of the voice. And, And it's hard to tell, looking at the baptism of Jesus, whether anyone but John heard his heard his voice. Uh, we know, do know that on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter and James and John heard that same voice basically testify to the same thing. This is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased, adding, hear him. And uh, But I, I don't think that that's what he's got in mind here. Uh, but uh, But again... They were not attuned to the word of God. Even the apostle Paul, who was a scholar, uh, grew up, uh, or not grew up, but studied at the feet of Gamaliel uh, and knew the scriptures probably better than anyone else who was involved in the preaching of the gospel. He had missed so much. Uh, But when he came to face to face with Jesus, everything sort of started falling into place. Not that he wasn't inspired, but uh, his inspiration, of course, helped him to explain those things to man. But I really believe that he began to understand those things uh, when he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Okay, okay. Well, so what what we have here is he tell, and I, I think it's a good point, Bob, that you made. The Father himself who sent me has testified to me. But let's put it in a nutshell. You missed it. You you would not hear it. Even the scriptures themselves testify of me, but you ignored them as well. Um, and so the idea, he says, here you have someone, when he says you've never, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor see his, seen his form. My first thought, you read that, I think of, uh, people say, well, um, even Moses didn't see the face of God. He just saw the backside of God. But I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think he's talking about their blindness to what has been revealed. He says, you do not have his word abiding in you because him who, him he sent, you don't believe in him. You search the scriptures. He says, they are the ones that testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Um, they, they were yeah, blind, he- willfully blind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, John, I uh, this past Sunday night I preached a sermon from Second uh, Peter two, and I've been going through the book, and I, I've done like four sermons on Second Peter two so far, or five, uh, dealing with false teachers, you know, false prophets and false teachers, and and the last two lessons I've done are dealing with the character of false teachers, and and in the first lesson, I addressed uh, I, I addressed their blindness. And the qualities that were associated with uh, uh, basically their teaching, the fact that they determined to teach that which was error. And, and, and I'm a firm believer that if somebody's teaching error, they are a false teacher. They, and that is regardless of their character. They are a false teacher in that which they are teaching that is error. Now, how they respond when they're confronted with the truth you know, that determines the direction. But the second lesson that I presented, and this was this past Sunday night, is I talked about the character, the corrupt character of some false teachers. And I mean, and you go into a, 
their covetousness. You go into their, you go into their lustful. You go into their lustful actions, and and that's what you find there in Second Peter chapter two, and the point the point that I'm and the point I made at the conclusion of that lesson, is. While what makes a false teacher a false teacher is his teaching, but a teacher can teach the truth and still be false in the way that he lives. And uh, I think we have a little bit of both of that with these religious leaders. You know, Jesus over and over exposes their corrupt lifestyles. And it was their corrupt lifestyles that caused them to not to to not accept the truth they were not willing to walk away from those corrupt lifestyles and you know uh, there's an interesting observation there in second peter 2 uh peter gives the example of balaam you know, you, you know I re remember balaam's hired to curse israel and he blesses them but then he finds that workaround which is what numbers 25 is about I, the workaround where he convinces you know balak he says you know you take the moabites and you go uh, engage in immoral behavior with them and they'll follow your gods and or they'll follow your gods and God will punish them as a result of that. And, and what's interesting is he mentions he mentions Balaam, but he also mentions in the text the donkey. <laughs> you know, you know talking to the donkey and, and and the interesting thing about that is you know you in the midst of this talking about false teachers and their blindness, he gives the example of Balaam who is engaged in a discussion with a dumb animal. And, and the point is, is he cannot see, he cannot see what he is doing because he is so blinded. And in his case, we know it was covetousness. And that was one of the corruptions of the religious leaders that caused them to drive Jesus to the cross. So, so it's character as well as teaching. And, and oftentimes, a false teacher formulates what he will teach and what he will accept based upon his character. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a good point, especially when you look at Second Peter 2. Yeah. 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 And incidentally, <clears throat> I don't think, uh, you know, and this is a side note, uh, I don't think all false teachers fit into Second Peter. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I think it's a certain class okay. of false teachers. That's <laughs> Tom. Yeah, at that's a whole other story. Tom now, and now, truth now like I said, I you know, I if you're teaching error, you're a false teacher in that. But hey, Tom, I, I with a special type of yeah. false teacher. And it's the same type that Jesus is dealing with. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, you can have someone that teaches a false doctrine but not fit the character that Peter describes there. Yeah, driven by covetousness and deception. Yeah. Diotrephes, great example of that as well. You know, oh, Apollos, yeah. Apollos, you're right. He was teaching error. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. teaching error, but he was corrected. And as soon as he was corrected, he corrected. Yeah. So, Paul the same so, way. When Paul came to the truth, look at his you know, yeah. conversion. Yeah. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, an even greater example. So, yeah. yeah. So, at With least what Apollos. we have recorded. With Apollos, though, uh, what he preached was true as far as it went. It just didn't go far <clears throat> enough. Yeah, baptism because of Christ. He did not realize yeah. that the Messiah had come. Uh, he was not aware. Uh, perhaps he was, but he wasn't. Doesn't seem to have been aware of the Great Commission and of the difference between the baptizing that John and Jesus had done in the uh before the cross and the baptizing that the apostles were doing uh after the cross and after pentecost yeah one there's a lot of that to... oh go ahead bob go ahead. one other thing i want to point out is this mm -hmm. verse 39 you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life uh in what way did they think they had eternal life in the scriptures and and I think we, we get a sense of that in Matthew chapter 23, the way they handled uh, the scriptures. Uh, they were they were hypocrites. 
and they were uh, twisting the scripture uh, and, and other things. They, the customs uh, were sometimes contrary uh, to the scriptures. For example, the honor father and mother, that's what the scripture said that they went, well, you know, if you just promise that to the temple treasury, I'll just say. you won't have to take care of your father and mother. So they weren't really that concerned about doing what the scripture said. Uh, but they thought that having the scripture in and of itself uh, and, and reading the scripture such as they did in the synagogue, that they would have life in that. But they could not have the life promised in the scriptures because they were unwilling to, to come to Jesus. They they missed it. They weren't looking for the credentials of the Messiah in those in those scriptures. Yeah, you know, it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I, I, I was just going to, you know, you know, building on what Bob said there. Uh, you look at their lives. They they willingly declare. And you gave the example of Matthew 15. You know, they willingly declared uh, that we're going to accept what we want to accept. And if we don't want to accept something, we're going to find a way around that. And and uh, that's exactly what we have in our text that we're dealing with here. You know, it testifies of me. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Jesus will later later on in John, John chapter 11 or 12, you know, he, he will specifically make the statement. I don't care if you like me. You know, but look at the works that I do. You know that I could not do these works if God were not with me. So I mean, he, he's very he's very forward about that. So they clearly they they picked what they wanted, and if it was something they didn't like, that explained it away. And and so we've got the examples, and that takes you to the Matthew twenty three, and other passages. Distinctions they made like uh, working on the Sabbath. Uh, if you used, uh, you could use a rope to hold your robe together. So using a rope to hold your ro robe together was not work, but they would use that same belt or rope to tie sticks together <laughs> and think, well, it's a belt. And so I can do it. It's not, it's not a sin. And so the hairline distinctions that they made, uh, distinctions without a difference as sometimes uh, sometimes we say right yeah well yeah i always use the illustration of the needle you know yeah. uh you, you you would have a you would have somebody that worked on a cloth and that they'd stick the needle in the top of their the thing and you can't do that on the sabbath because because uh, i mean if if you're a seamstress or something like that you might see a tear somewhere and be tempted to sew and because that's your work uh, that's what that's what your job is during the week. Obviously, you're working on the Sabbath, and so you can't do that. So, so. Ryan, you, you know what? He, no, I would just I would just kind of kind of stepping back to say what's interesting is that uh, several times Jesus is going to point to the the people uh, throughout the Old Testament, in particular. Um, you know, of course, the scriptures in total testify of him, but he'll kind of point in particular here to Moses. Later, he'll point to Abraham. And he'll kind of make the point to say, you know, Abraham, Moses, they, uh, I was the thing that they wanted to talk about. And it, you claim to respect Moses or you claim to respect Abraham. And yet, you know, you're, you're not actually responding to the things their whole purpose was to talk about me and to, to get you ready for me. And you've missed what they're all about. And it's kind of interesting that he would pull these people you could call the heroes of faith if you would, uh, several times, he'll kind of point to them and say, look, here's Moses. Moses testifies of me. You know, here, look, here's Abraham. Abraham, you know, points to me. Um, you know, you have these uh, statements throughout the scriptures of people that were looking for him and uh, the significance of that. You know, I kind of thought it'd be interesting. Uh, you guys have made a couple of comments, and I think, it, Bob, you actually kind of talked about this a little bit, but maybe I'd like to hear a little bit more. Uh, we've kind of said that John is the last of the four Gospels. Um and uh, Bob, you really gave some really interesting uh, information there, talking about the nature of inspiration and how that works. What other evidences are there that John is probably the last of the four Gospels? What uh, and and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. I'm curious because I know Tom, you said something about that, and 
And uh, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say about that. Here, uh, here's my thinking on that. As, as I pointed out, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, and that simply means for the benefit of the listeners, uh, uh, unity or sameness. Uh, synoptic, we get synonym from that. And so they all take about the same kind of approach to, to what they're writing. They're all writing about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. But they had different purposes for writing. Matthew's writing in order to establish that Jesus is the rightful king. Uh, Matthew, that Jesus is the, uh, the, the, uh, the I, I guess the, uh, Matthew, Matthew is the king. Mark is the servant. Luke is the man. Is that kind of what you Luke see it as? The man. Yeah. And so the only thing really is left is the deity of Christ. And so it makes sense that that would, it, and I guess this is a subjective argument. It makes sense that that would be the cap. Yeah. Uh, I actually think, Bob, I'm going to interrupt you a second. I actually think it's not subjective. I actually think there's a testimony in the Old Testament that says that the revelation of the Messiah would be in four parts. Uh, that expression that's used sometimes in the Old Testament, the branch prophecy, behold the branch. It, there, there are seven, I could be wrong, could be eight, uh, branch prophecies in the Old Testament where it says, behold the branch. And the branch is called four things. He's called God, he's called the man, he's called the servant, and he's called the king. And so it's kind of interesting that the four gospels seem to focus on Jesus that way. So I think it might even, it might be the case could be made. It's not just subjective, that there might've been a prophetic element of the Christ being revealed in this four dimensional way. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, that connection, of course, like I said, it doesn't ever specifically point to that, but it seems pretty clear that that's the path. So Bob, I think I think your point is really good and I think maybe even more than just a subjective observation it might actually be a scriptural prophecy about that. And another point is it answers all questions. Yeah. Mm. There there is not a question left uh that we need an answer to after John. Before John yes, uh before before John is written, the argument could be made still that Jesus was a man. You can't make that argument now. Once the apostle John has written, he in the beginning. He's only when it goes back to the beginning. Now, uh, again, Matthew, the beginning of the line uh, of heredity. Uh, with Mark, the beginning of the uh, work of John as it leads almost immediately into the ministry of Jesus. And Luke, the beginning of the, uh, of the, of the family of John the Baptist. Uh, but John, the apostle, goes back to the beginning of everything and, uh, and, and brings you to, uh, as, as has been pointed out, uh, miracles and uh, not just miracles, but conversations that have so much significance. I don't think there is any conversation in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that it is as long as any one conversation in the Gospel of John. And so, so few, con so few con conversations in the Gospel of John. But look at those conversations, and uh, look at what they what they reveal uh, about uh, about Jesus. And some of those conversations are with his enemies. Uh, and when we get to John chapter seven, we'll read about the uh, the chief priests who sent the temple guard to arrest Jesus, and they come back empty-handed. Is that why have you brought him? We ain't never heard nobody speak like him. And so uh, there's so much more to impress upon the readership in the Gospel of John, it seems to me, than in the other three. 
Yeah, you know, uh, and if I if I could build on that, you know, uh, John in his letters clearly is addressing Gnosticism, which goes to some of what Bob was talking about, questioning the deity of Jesus and and the person of Jesus. And his gospel establishes that. Uh, and, and and tying into that, you know, you know, studying the uh, studying the gospels from a standpoint of when they were written and so on. And, and I'm talking about going external as well as internal type things. Uh, it is universally accepted that either Matthew or Mark was the earliest. You know, you can make an argument for either one of those as being the earliest of the gospels. Luke comes along. Well, we know when Luke wrote. <laughs> I mean, it was it was it was uh, at the it, during Paul's third journey and 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 things associated with that. And then John comes along, and like like Bob said, you know, he 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 fills in the blanks. And and, and you know, I, I can give you a couple of examples of this. Uh, uh, when you go, you know, it's interesting in Matthew's account where they're searching for accusers for Jesus, and I think Luke does this too. You know, he said he would destroy the temple in three days. Or, uh, he said he was going to destroy the temple and, and raise it in three days and so on. Uh, or, or he just said he was going to destroy the temple. And it doesn't even explain where that came from. John does. John in John chapter 2. Uh, the other one that I would mention is the conversation that Jesus had with Pilate. Uh, I really find this interesting that uh, you've got, it's, it's, it's Matthew or Luke, I get them mixed up, I, I'm thinking it was Luke, but, uh, but Jesus, uh, uh, or, uh, Jesus is accused of being a king, this is, a, I guess Luke's I think, Jesus is accused of, of being a king, uh, you know, insurrection and so on, and you find in there, Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus says, it is as you say, and in the next verse he says, I find no fault with him. I, I mean, I mean, a completely incomplete head scratcher, you know, you know, okay, yeah, I'm a king. Oh, but I find no fault with him. Well, you know what? You go to the gospel of John, John fills in the blank. The conversation that Jesus has with Pilate and John explains the kingdom that Jesus was trying to establish. So, so there's all kinds of reasons to, to establish that that uh, John is the last of the Gospels. All right, Paul, you know, one of the that's things... my thought. Oh, go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, um, I've got something that's come up here. We've got about eight minutes left. Um, if y'all wanted to, we could read through 41 through 47, and then I can step away and leave the three of y'all discussing it, and then be back in time to kind of close us out. Yeah, let's do that. All right, Tom, um, go ahead if you would. Let's read 41 through 47. All right. So, so he's finished talking about these four witnesses. And in verse 41, he says, I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my work? All right, so Brian, I'm gonna step away, and if you want to just kind of take the lead and, and kind of walk through this, I'll be back you yeah. know, to, to close us out. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say here, um, because the language about coming in the Father's name is, of course, very instru instrumental and very important. Um, what do you guys think about the coming in the Father's name, and perhaps some of the things that are found in John? I, I guess first of all, let's start off by saying, what do you, what would you say it means to come in the Father's name? Authority, you know, in, in, okay. in the name of always means the idea of authority. And, and and again, you go back to the witnesses that Jesus has talked about up to this point. And, and, and I go back specifically to, I go back specifically to the, the miracles. You know, 
Jesus makes the strongest arguments about how miracles establish that God is with you. Because the definition of a genuine miracle is something that cannot be done, that is impossible to be done naturally. Uh, now, it may involve just a single element, like, for example, time or something to that effect, but it is something that is impossible naturally. And Jesus, he's just done, you know, I, I mean, Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Uh, uh, he, uh, I think some of the most amazing statements that we might not think about of the miracles of Jesus is when it says he healed them all. You know, I, I mean, I mean, you know, we we have we have just a couple of dozen miracles recorded in the Gospels, but then you've got those expressions that say he healed them all, which means you know crowds were coming to him, and it's almost like Jesus waved his hand, and everybody, whatever their ailment was, he healed. Oh, you can you can only do that if God is with you, and uh, and and. Uh, then you do have, and I don't think you can separate this. I understand the point Bob's making. Don't disagree with it, but you can't separate it that at least three different occasions, God's voice testified to somebody that it was him, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and now the two of them might have been limited audience. You know, I, I hadn't thought about uh, this is my beloved son to John the Baptist, that it was just John that heard it. I mean, every, those who were there, whoever they were, would have seen the Spirit descending. But there's another occasion in what, John 11 or John 12, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I have glorified him. And, and that's to a crowd. Uh, you know, I, I mean, so it is testified. So Jesus is, Jesus is clearly declaring that, you know, I could not do what I do if God was not with me. And by the way, you know that. I, 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 I think that's the kind of a thing. That's not the word that's used, but that's the point. You know that. You can't deny that that's the case. You just are blind. You, you've, chosen to talk, you've chosen to talk to the donkey rather than listen. So anyways, that's my... Nice. Nice point. Word. Nice point. Bob, you got anything to throw out there? Yeah, I want to go back and tie, tie verse 41 and 44 together. In verse 41, I do not receive honor from men. That does not mean that he did not deserve to be honored or that he did not uh, recognize his right to be honored by men. But honor from men was not his primary concern. And then in verse 44, he says, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. And so go, going back to verse 41, that's the honor about which he was concerned. He was concerned with the honor that came to him from the Father. They were not concerned with that honor. They received honor from men. It's kind of like the, the false teachers that Paul deals with in Corinth. They were patting one another on the back, judging one another by one another. And he says, that ain't right. Uh, and, and so, uh, and then in verses 43, and, uh, four, verse 42 and 43, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. And so that is to me leading up to verse 44, I have come in my father's name. Therefore, I receive honor from him. And you do not receive me because you do not seek the honor uh, from God. But if another comes in his own name, him you will receive because you're concerned only with the honor uh, from men. And so I, I, I see that as a tight knit unit there in verses 41 through, uh, through 44. So that's a, that's a really good comment. You know, I hadn't thought about what you're saying, but I can also see going back to verse 34 where he says, um, you know, I don't receive testimony from men. I don't receive honor from men. You know, that he's receiving testimony from the Father. He's receiving honor from the Father. Um, I like that. I hadn't really caught that before. That's a pretty uh, a pretty neat idea. You know, one, one last thought maybe to throw at this too. You know, when you talk about coming in the name of the Father, um, we, we oftentimes remember, of course, that 
that God reveals his name, and this is probably more the name of Godhead, all three uh, persons in one, but that name Jehovah in the Old Testament, which means I am. And probably a lot of people are familiar with the I am statements that Jesus makes in the book of John, that, uh, you know, there are seven times where Jesus will say, I am, you know, I am the resurrection, I am the life, I am, you know, the way, uh, these these statements that G I am the door, I'm the good shepherd, um, these statements that Jesus will make about his identity also include that divine name, so to speak. And there's a couple of times where that divine name might be particularly invoked, uh, perhaps in John chapter 8, when Jesus uh, says, before Abraham was, I am, and they pick up stones to kill him, uh, that it might have been that they particularly uh, understood that or saw that as a declaration of Jesus uh, in the name of the Father, too. Kind of hard for us to know for sure because of the uh, a linguistic you know, movement, uh, you know, from different languages. But we do know that that was the sacred name uh, that uh, God had had, and Jesus had that name too. Jesus uh, bore that name as well. So, you know, to come in that name might even have a, a, a secondary meaning too. But I certainly like what you guys have said about this. Um, and I'm trying to think, is there anything else we, we want to pull out of these passages here? Yeah. Um Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I have one more. Uh, uh, go down to verses 45 through 7, you know, wrapping this up. Uh, don't think that I accuse you to the Father. There's one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. You know, you know. I, I mean, they, Abraham and Moses, and, and David, but primarily Abraham and Moses were the two key characters. I, I, I find it interesting, you know, the prophecies that Moses made about Jesus You've got uh, Genesis Genesis 3, which is uh, the seed of woman. Genesis 12, and in your seed all nations shall be blessed indirectly. And then you have Deuteronomy 18, 15, and following. Uh, I send a, uh, a, there there will come another prophet in my and my name, and basically he's saying like me, another prophet like me. And what he's saying is he's going to be a lawgiver. Yeah. And what's interesting, if I understand correctly, and again, I'm not as versed on Jewish history and these types of things, but I don't think that they uh, believed as Jesus was on earth that that had been fulfilled yet. Yeah. In other words, I think that they were still looking for that prophet slash Messiah uh, so on and so forth. And he had not come back. And so when Jesus says, you don't believe me, you know what? I fit the bill of what Moses said. Uh, think about Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And, he, uh, you know, I've come to fulfill the law and all those types of things. They didn't want to accept him. And that was really the bottom line of what you have there. So, so Moses, the one that they trust the most, he prophesied about Jesus. They were just too blind to even consider Jesus as the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so I think I think that factor, and I think that's kind of the, the final point that he's driving home here in these four witnesses that we've talked about. I just have two quick points, uh, uh, John. Uh, David also was identified, or the Messiah was also identified as being as coming from the seed of David. Uh, and so uh, there's that aspect, seed of woman, seed of Abraham, seed of David, the prophet. Uh, also, we normally think of Satan as the accuser, and rightly so. He is the accuser. Uh, I believe, Brian, that that is what the name Satan means, right? Mm -hmm. the accuser. Mm -hmm. And yet here, God's word is the accuser uh, because they had rejected God's word and Satan didn't have to accuse them. God's word accused them and be, be, uh, betrayed them or belied their claim to love God and to love his word. And, and so, uh, you do not believe his writings. And if you don't, how will you believe my words? 
you, you, you don't accept me as the seed of woman. You don't accept me as the seed of Abraham. You don't accept me as the prophet. And you don't accept me as the seed of David. Uh, why don't you? You don't believe God. God's word is your accuser. Okay. All right. Well, guys, uh, sorry I had to step out there with some last-minute work going on at the building, and a, a box of, of floor base had got misplaced. And um, and the gentleman doing the work speaks Spanish pretty much all. <laughs> so it took a little bit to get the communication figured out there. But All right. Well, let's plan then next week to pick up with Chapter 6, Verse 1. Sound good? Sounds good. Bring your appetites. He's going to be feeding 5,000. So good to go yeah. all right listen we'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our study for this week um hopefully we'll have brendan and or paul back with us as well but we won't have brian so it'll be a good study brian is going down to to uh yugoslavia i'm sorry peru peru <laughs> he's right. going to peru. he's going to peru's peru yeah yeah mako Picchu, machu Picchu area Anyway, I appreciate everybody for joining us. And Lord willing, we'll be back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time right here. Um, Truth Factor Live, both on Facebook and YouTube. And our website is truthfactor.com. Uh, Bob, do you have something to say? I'm just waving goodbye. All right. <laughs> Bye, y'all. See you next week.